Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Drought Workshop. And for those who don't know who I am, I'm David Huboy. I'm chairman of the Green Business Committee with the San Benito County Chamber of Commerce. Good to see you here. Well, thank you. This, this workshop is sponsored by the Chamber, Farmhouse Communications, the Water Resources Association of San Benito County, and the Hollister Office of the Natural Resource Center. And uh, if I may have a little, ask you guys to, if you have your cell phones, can you please turn them off? <laughs> And let's have a round of applause for Christina Chavez Wyatt for bringing us this delicious breakfast this morning with Farmhouse Communications. <laughs> Christina, would you like to say a few words? Sure, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Chavez Wyatt, and I'm president of Farmhouse Communications. And I have a small public affairs and communications firm here in Hollister. I've been operating for about three years, and one of the things that I is my expertise is connecting businesses and community members with government. And I do that through public-private partnerships as an executive director of the San Diego County Business Council. And I'm also doing some economic development work and hopefully doing some more tourism marketing here in the community. Again, I'd like to thank you all for coming here and uh, paying some very important attention and time to an issue that's very important to our community and working forward in sustainability. And uh, as we're very proud to be a sponsor of the breakfast today. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Christina. Well, I see some familiar faces here. And uh, pleased to announce some of the dignitaries from elected offices present today. Representing State Senator Anthony Canella, we have Reed Sanders. Reed. Good morning, everyone. Is Daniel Dodge here from uh, Louis Lake? Daniel Dodd from Luis Alejo's office. The Board of Supervisor, Jaime De La Cruz. Jaime. Our esteemed Mayor of Hollister, Ignacio Velasquez. And also former City Councilman and Mayor, Robbie Scatini. Good friend of mine also. Hey, Robbie. And uh, I'm going to uh, kind of break the tradition here. I'm going to announce the San Benito County Planning Commissioner. I'm a, actually a, a planning commissioner for the city. Ray Pierce with the San Benito County Planning Commission. <laughs> and also we have uh, custom to announce our board members from the chamber. We have Richard Ponce. Richard. Our CEO of the chamber, Debbie Taylor. Victor, of course, Victor. Where's Victor? Victor Gomez, City Councilman, City Hollister. Victor. How could I forget Victor? <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything about that. Okay. And we also have coming up a distinguished group of speakers with who I will announce individually. You know, this ongoing drought, the worst recorded drought in California's history, We've reached a point now where, you know, we can either wait for an El Nino to bail us out or we can decide to take some action. And that's what's been on the agenda for our Green Committee. We've decided that's time to act. And that's why we're here today to have this workshop. I know we have attendees here today that represent interests in agriculture, ranching, businesses, and residents, and the commonality of what affects us all is water. And when I went to the closet today to reach for a tie to figure out what I'm going to wear for this drought workshop, I chose this Vincent Van Gogh tie. And you'll see that, uh, I believe it's one when he was painting in, in southern France, Arles, France, in those hot, arid area within in the fields there. and. Uh, when you look at it, uh, he was laboring in the blinding sun. You would expect that he would have a canteen of water nearby. I don't know what you think of when you think of water, your connotation of water, Niagara Falls, you know, or some nice scenic lake. What I think is, uh, sometimes I think of Vincent Van Gogh out there sweating in the fields. And as the world population has increased, the major aquifers 
have decreased. And like Van Gogh's canteen, water is essentially confined. We know from necessity to consider it as a finite resource only to have water we have now. 97% of the water on Earth is salt water. You know, can't drink salt waters. And the only remaining 3% of that 3%, 1% is available for drinking. The other 2% is locked in glaciers and ice caps. Also considering the state population will grow, continue to grow to 60 million Californians by the year 2050. That means more people, farms, and businesses will rely on our rivers, reservoirs, and groundwater for their daily needs. I guess we can take water for granted. That is, that is until our monthly water bill comes in the mail and it skyrockets. Or, without knowing how long the drought will continue, we can be more mindful of its importance. As Ben Franklin stated in Poor Richard's Almanac, when the well runs dry, we know the importance of water. With this workshop, we will not be breaking off into splinter groups. Our group is just right here. Yes, individu individually we can make a difference, as Vincent Van Gogh states. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. When it comes to water conservation, it's not a matter of relying on others, but what we can each do in our community. Because here in San Benito County is where it happens and where change is effective. With assistance by the Water Resources Association of San Benito County and through the water agencies they represent, we have reduced water to use from 212 gallons per capita per day in the late 1990s to 161 gallons per capita per day in 2010 and are hopefully on track to achieve 129 gallons per capita per day by the year 2020. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentations today. I ask not only to you to ask questions, but feel free to share your experience and or ideas to save water. Yes, this workshop is to share, learn, and find ways to participate locally to make a difference. So beginning with the regional picture here, I present our first speaker, Mr. Harry Bloom, and he is the project manager for the Hollister Urban Area Water Project. Harry? Good morning. Uh, I am the program manager for the Hollister Air Urban Area a water project and I'll uh, roar through these slides pretty quickly but by way of background uh, I am a native of Hollister and I left to see the world save the world and I've come back to save Hollister and I'm hoping that you all will help the purpose of the Hollister urban area water project is to uh, deliver better quality water to increase our water supply make it more reliable and then help protect our groundwater basin. And as I'll point out as we go forward, we're in good shape in the Hollister area, San Benito County, from the standpoint of a water supply, a reliable water supply, because we have replenished our groundwater and we have protected it. And we have to continue to do that because all you have to do is look at neighboring communities to see what the disastrous effects are if you don't have a water supply. These are the, I'd say, the, the five bullets that, that are, are guiding all of us. Um, the community came together in, in 19, uh, 2004 and agreed that there would be a Hollister urban area master plan prepared to look after our future. And the, the three original agencies were the city of Hollister, San Benito County and San Benito County Water District. Sunny Slope County Water District uh, joined a bit later, but they were always a part of the overall planning process. And so we can look back uh, 10 years ago and even further and say that the community leaders understood there was going to be a need. They didn't know the magnitude that we now understand because of the drought, but they formed what's called 
a governance committee to guide this work and the elements of the memorandum of understanding amongst all of the agencies include these uh, five bullets. Better quality drinking water, um, ability to use our wastewater now and in the future because that's a resource we don't want to uh, lose. The rest of the world uses its wastewater effectively and we want to do the same. We want to um, have a reliable water supply, that's our future. Locally financed and affordability is a major issue. We've kept our money in the county, and affordability has been our, our watchword as we go forward. Now, the uh, first members of the governance committee, and I don't think any are present, uh, impressed upon everybody involved that if we're going to go forward, it has to be affordable. And then we need local control to meet state regulations, and what's not stated here is there are federal regulations as well. So we can't be independent. This is the Hollister urban area that's uh, in, in our study area and in our implementation area. And you can see the airports to the north. There is, uh, to the right, there's a second blue line there. That's Doria, that's Fairview Road. And then uh, at the bottom of the screen is Ridge Mark. Then it goes out to the water reclamation facility area to the left there. And then the, there are two proposed facilities uh, the uh, red dot right there is the new water reclama uh, the new water treatment plant, and then over where it says Fairview Tanks, there's the less salt uh, water treatment plant that's being upgraded now. So those of you that drive along Fairview Road can see the, the new tanks and the new facilities that are being installed there. Backwards. Yeah. All right, so what happened is, is that the, the, the measure of quality that we're, we're following here in the urban area is first is total dissolved solids. And we have very high naturally occurring dissolved solids. And we're in the neighborhood of the 1100 or 1200 parts per million or milligrams per liter and we want to be down much lower than that in the 500 to 700 range because those of you that wash your cars yourselves and don't go to the um, car wash, you'll see salt deposits on your car after you finish or you see salt deposits on your windows after you wash them and that is not a good thing. The other measure is hardness and those of you that have appliances have seen the deposits and, and know that hardness is not uh, ideal as well. So we want supply reliability, we want local control. There are two things that the state and the federal government have mandated for us to follow. One is the disinfection byproducts, DBPs, and that's a result of, of generally if you uh, disinfect with chlorine, it forms uh, a compound with the organic substances in the water and those are called disinfection byproducts, and they're a mild carcinogen. And then the waste discharge requirements, that's to protect our, our, our groundwater. And then lastly, the, the major item is all of these things are aimed at protecting our groundwater uh, for our future. So well, this gives you a, a, an idealistic look at our groundwater basin. And the South County, starting Hernandez, the Assembly River and the drainage basin, uh, the groundwater uh, percolates to the north and uh, into our groundwater basin. And as it percolates, uh, there's rain that, that contributes to our water supply. There's stream flow percolation that comes from the north or the South County. And then there's planned percolation. Uh, somebody brought up that, that we, ha we have been percolating uh, with the uh, uh, blue valve water that comes in from San Luis. And then we extract uh, all over through, through uh, particularly through well extraction. But the point that, that's significant on this slide is that lip at Chittenden that 
the water doesn't leave the basin unless it's as high as that naturally occurring lip. And as a result, as you uh, deposit salts on the ground or from your water softeners or from your wastewater discharges, it goes into the groundwater basin and just gets recirculated. And so over time, our salt content has been building up year after year after year. And it, what that means is it degrades the quality of the water. And what we're trying to do in this project is, is, uh, is avoid uh, bringing in or, or adding more salts to the water. This is to show you the value of another value of our, of our groundwater. On the left is San Luis Reservoir, and that's two million acre feet of storage. On the far right is our local reservoirs. That'd be San Justo, uh, further south is Hernandez. And our groundwater is 500,000. That storage, if it were to be built using uh, dams and reservoirs, would be a cost to you all in the neighborhood of, of several hundred million dollars to replace the groundwater storage with surface water storage. And even if you could build it because of all the environmental constraints. So in summary, what we're, we're, we're surviving because of our groundwater. Our long-term solution is to use both groundwater and imported high-quality water, but the groundwater is, is far and away the most essential source because it's ours and we control it. The um, Bureau of Reclamation that supplies our blue valve water this year had zero allocation for agriculture, you probably read that in the paper. And the urban area was cut back to 70% of, of historical. So we must provide good quality and reliable water. Our groundwater table is, is and, and basin is essential. And we hope that you all will support all of the agency's efforts because they've been working very hard at uh, maintaining the quality of our water so that we can have a viable future. Thank you. Okay, now next is the Water Conservation Program Manager for the Water Resources Association of San Benito County and my co-host for Going Green Show, affectionately known as Sean O. Sean Novak. Sean. Thank you, David. Um, first of all, let me tell you about my agency. All those words and everything, it sounds like it's a huge agency. But it's me, and I got a three-quarter time person. So, and I'm proud of, we, we get around the county a lot, but we serve the city of Hollister, the city of San Juan Bautista, uh, Sunny Slope County Water District, and uh, San Benito County Water District, primarily Zone 6, which is like a ring around that urban area that just saw on the map there it's kind of the outer ring of that area but I just wanted to tell you that because a lot of people go wow it's like this big agency no it's we're really actually small but why are we here today how did the drought happen I think this picture is really good these are satellite images from NASA you can see you can see here in July uh, January of 2013 this was our snowpack and you have to remember that in 2013 we were still below normal rainfall and snow so this is not what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to be even further white up and down here. Now this year, January of 2014, look at that. And there's barely any snow up there. It's amazing. I have never seen that before. It was just astounding what happened. And then here's a re recent picture of San Luis Reservoir. So as you know, that, that Central Valley Project water, we depend on that snowpack to fill the rivers and stuff so we can collect the runoff, store it in places like San Luis Reservoir so we can use it in the summertime for our ag community residents, replenish our groundwater supply. So it's very important. You can see how low it is right here. So let's talk about our water supply. I know Harry was talking about an acre feet of water. What is an acre foot of water? Well, it's 325,851 gallons. So it's a lot of water there. 
And as Harry was saying, our groundwater is our main supply. In the groundwater, groundwater report that was produced at the end of 2013 in December, we showed that there was almost 30,000 acre feet of water pumped out of our groundwater basin. I'm sure it's going to be higher this year when that report is uh, put together in December. So that's, that's, that's a lot of water, right? And then our imported water from the Central Valley project this year. We normally, the contract that the district has with the Bureau is for 8,250 acre feet for urban, 35,000 for ag. Well, this year, we got 3,889 acre feet for urban and this amount for ag. But the, the reason we had that amount there was the district had enough foresight to see it was gonna be a dry summer. So they stored some water over in the Central Valley so they could bring it over. They did that, I think, towards the end of the summer of 2013, somewhere around there. They stored it so they could bring it over in the, the springtime here in the summer to give to the farmers here so they'd have a little bit of that from the belt water. So that's, that's really good. But here's the main point I wanted to show you too. Our rainfall totals average, the average rainfall is 11 to 13 inches of rain per year. That's on average. You can see in 2012, we were below that. 2013, we were way below that. It's half below that. And then this year, so it's been catastrophic. But you also have to remember 2007, 2008, 2009, we also had dry years way below our normal precipitation. So we're going on, I've been here 10 years. We've been below our normal um, rainfall six of those 10 years. So it's been pretty dry for a long time. So what can you do? Residential water conservation, what are some of the things you can do? Let's get into that right away. First of all, I wanted to show you this, this pie chart because this kind of shows you why we promote some of our programs. If you do not have a low flow toilet, that toilet of yours uses 26.7% of all indoor water use in your house. Now this is based on an average family of four. If you do not have a high efficiency clothes washer, it uses 21.7% of the total indoor water usage. So between those two right there, that's almost 50% of your indoor water use. That's why we really focus on those programs. We also offer low flow shower heads, faucet aerators, and we check for leaks. And you can see between those right there, it's 28, and we got like another about 41. That's almost the whole pie right there. So that's why we really focus on those things. And we give out low flow shower heads and faucet aerators. We give out low flow toilets and we have rebates on clothes washers. So that's, that's why we're focusing on those things. Um, as far as the toilets go, this is probably our best known program. If you have a toilet that was manufactured before 1992, it uses anywhere from three and a half to seven gallons per flush. We've gotten most of those, we very rarely see the seven gallons per flush toilets come in anymore when people swap them out. But I do know there's a bunch of the 3.5 gallon per flush out there still. I know, you know a lot of the big subdivisions were put in, like in Ridgemark and South Side of States, things like that. Those were all in the 80s, right around there. So the, a lot of those toilets still are three and a half gallons per flush. Now my agency, we came into existence in 1999 and really started going in the early 2000s. But we've um, replaced over 7,000 toilets in the Hollister urban area. So that's a lot of toilets. We estimate there's probably about 18,000 when we started. So we're not even halfway there yet. So I know there's a lot of old toilets out there. And a lot of people, they still hold on to the idea when the low flow toilets came out, they had the double flushing problems on it. I think everybody's heard that, right? Well, what happened is, is California was the first state in the country to require low flow toilets. So all the manufacturers did was shrink the, the toilet tanks. They didn't re-engineer the toilets. So it didn't work very well. And that was really a big mistake because people were like, why do I want to put a low flow toilet in when I have to flush it twice? It defeats the purpose. <coughs> Well, in 94, uh, the EPA made it the standard for the whole country, and that's when you started to see them re-engineer toilets. So like the toilets we give out, the free toilets that we have, they flush 650 grams of waste, which is like 34 ounces. So that's, it, they flush a lot. They're very good quality toilets. And if you want to go out and buy your own toilet, all the toilets are low flow now, so you can pick any model that you want. And we have a $75 rebate if you're replacing one of those older toilets. So as you saw by that pie chart, that's the biggest water user inside your home. So that's the first thing you can do. The laundry room. 
And I'm not asking you to go out and scrap your top loading washer right now, but when it comes time to replace it, consider getting one of these front load uh, washers. We recognize what's called Energy Star rated washing machines because those are put through all kinds of tests and they, they meet our water requirements. And you say, this says 16 gallons per load, but I do, I've read some of the manufacturer's specs and some are as much as 20 to 25 gallons per load, depending on what model you buy. But we have a $100 rebate because those, those washers are still a little higher than the top loaders, but I have seen them come down. So we offer the $100 rebate to kind of help give you an incentive to buy a high efficiency washer. And then PG&E has rebates as well. So between the two rebates there, you can get it down to where it's really competitive with the top loading washers as well. So I ask that you consider that when it comes time to replace your washer. Now you also remember in that, that uh, pie chart that uh, shower heads and faucets uh, use a lot of water. We can come to your house, my agency, the water resources, we can install shower heads and faucet aerators. And I know people are like, what am I gonna get a trickle out of my, my shower? No, these new shower heads, they actually inject air into the water stream so it feels like it's a, a good force to it. I have them at my house and I love it. The one I have has a massage feature on it. As I get older, they put that on my back. I like it. Anyway, and then we have the faucet aerators here that are one gallon per minute. Okay, so that, that helps a lot a lot because a, a faucet without an aerator on it can use the six to seven gallons per minute. So you got four people in your house. As David was saying, collectively, we do these little actions. Collectively, it works into a lot of water safe. Leaks. Number one problem. We don't, we don't like leaks, all right? And that's something else we'll do for you is we'll come out to your house and we show you how to read your water meter if you don't know how to use it because Ed is such a valuable tool. I mean, all you gotta do is turn off the water at your house, wait a few minutes, and go out and look at your meter. And if you see that little uh, leak dial on there, it's a little small dial inside the dial. If that's turning at all, that indicates there's a leak, okay? And then we can come out there, we can try to find it for you. And if it's something simple like a toilet flapper's worn out on your toilet, which you'd be surprised, people don't think that's a big thing, but it's leaking water 24 seven, and you may not hear it. And that's going 24 seven, that can add up to a lot of water. I get a lot of people call me and say, oh my Lord, my water bill this month. And we go out there and they have two toilets that had to, the flappers were bad on them. So anyway, we can do that for you free of charge. We carry those on the truck. And then, you know, as you can see, a small little drip, can, one gallon equals 15,000 drips. And I know 15,000 seems like a lot, but over the course of a day, you'd be surprised how fast that adds up. Okay, so this is one thing. We try to point out, point out personal habits versus hardware. Like we have hardware we can give you, the shower heads, the faucet aerators, the toilets. You, know, you go out and buy the washing machines, irrigation hardware. But a lot of this requires your, some changing of personal habits. I know when I first started shaving, I kept that water running the whole time I was shaving. Okay, well I learned, I fill up the basin now, put a plug in there and rinse out my razor and that. So little things like that, and there's a ton of them. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it because I mean we could go on and on. But like here's some examples here. And I have these, don't feel like you have to write these down. I have a list in the back of the room which you're welcome to grab and take with you. But you know, little things like washing your fruits and vegetables in a pan of water instead of running the water from the tap while you're rinsing them off. Uh, don't use running water to thaw food. You know, defrost food in the refrigerator. And you know, and then you start getting, you know, cook food in as little water as possible. I mean, you know, you could, you could get really radical with some of these ideas and really go nuts. But, but I just wanted to show you some of these ideas. And like I said, I have these written on a, on a sheet of paper back there. And you can see they go on and on and on. So there's, and I'm sure some of you probably have some things that you do which I haven't heard of or you'd like to share with the group later when we get the question and answer period. But here's some for the bathroom. I just focused on a few, like I said. You know, turn, we all hear turn off the water when you're brushing your teeth or shaving, like I just told you. Uh, a lot of people use the toilet as a waste basket. You know, they sit there, blow their nose, and throw the Kleenex in the toilet and flush it. That, Please don't do that, that's wasting water for no purpose at all. Um, I told you about my shaving thing. When washing your hands, turn the water off while you're lathering, little things like that. And I know it seems minuscule, but again, collectively, we're talking a lot of water saved. Now, if you, you wanna get more ideas about this, our website, which <coughs> my card and our literature has our website on it. I have some links up here. This one that says conservation links. 
there's some great links that you can kind of go around your house. And what I encourage people to do is go around their house, do a water inventory. Inventory where you're using water. You know, you use it in the laundry room, you use it in the kitchen, you use it to wash your car, you do use it outside. And just kind of focus where you're using water and think about ideas and ways you can reduce that. It's, you know, we'd be glad to come out to your house and consult with you. But, you know, it takes actions on the community's part. Each one of you have to have the initiative to do this. We also do some resource protection. One of the things I'm sure you've heard about that's been in the news a lot is water softeners. And as Harry was saying, our groundwater basin is so critical for our water supply, but yet we have hard water. Well, people buy water softeners, which I understand, you know, to soften the water. But the, a lot of these uh, water softeners run on salt. And so the salty brine that's left over after they generate soft water, that just goes down into the sewer system. Very little of that salt's taken out before it's reintroduced back into the groundwater basin. So we actually are compounding the problem. We have hard water, we soften it, we take the salty brine, put it back into the groundwater again. So it's a, it's a big problem. And, and we know that ag adds to this as well, but this is probably one of the more controllable sources of salt. And the technology's starting to catch up. There's a lot of saltless uh, water conditioning systems out there that I've been getting really good reports about. So there, there are some uh, technology changes that are helping us. But right now, my agency offers a rebate on the older water softeners. If you currently have a water softener that was uh, manufactured before 1999, they're very inefficient because most of those are those clock-based ones. You set it for a time of day and wish to regenerate. And whether you're home or not, it's regenerating soft water. So right there, you're wasting water. Also, the older ones, they're not as efficient with their use of salt. The new water softeners actually can process more hardness molecules per pound of salt than the older ones. So they cut down on the salt, cut down on the water, and they cut down on electric, uh, electricity use. So we have a, um, I, I just took somebody, we did a study way back in the early 2000s, and they identified about 2,000 water softeners around the Hollister urban area. And we did a survey and we found out most of those older water softeners use about two 40 pound bags of salt each month. I know you go to the store, you see those big 40 pound bags. So that equals 80 <coughs> pounds a month for each one of those. That's 160,000 pounds of salt are going into our sewer system each month. That's a lot of, that's a lot of salt. So as I said, it's compounding our problem. So we're trying to get people to transition over to the newer technology right now. I do know there is a um, ordinance that's going around right now through the city, trying to support this effort by banning salt using water softeners. Not all water softeners, but the ones that use salt that, that empty into a public sewer system. So that'll help our effort now. But for right now, we're trying to get people with those older ones to transition into either new technology or go to one of those off-site services like uh, Culligan or uh, uh, EPG, EPC over in Gilroy that will come and deliver you a fresh uh, water softener supply each month and take away the old salty brine for, for uh, processing. Or if you don't feel you're using your water softener, I know a lot of people are not using it for some reason or it's gotten older, they haven't replaced it. Uh, we are offering $300 if you demolish it completely and don't replace it. So we're trying to get control of those water softeners. Now this is where the real water savings are going to be made um, here locally. Um, recently there's been a lot of water conservation legislation come up that has helped help our effort. Um, the green plumbing codes, which I know David's familiar with, is requiring all new housing to have these, you know, one. 0.28 gallon per flush toilets in the homes with the faucet areas, the shower heads, you know, when they're building the homes, really use these efficient fixtures. So that's kind of helping our effort. We've, the work we've been doing for the last 10 years, swapping out old toilets and things like that. So we're really getting a handle on indoor water use. What's the new frontier for us? We just started working on this about two or three years ago, is helping people on, uh, with their irrigation and their landscape needs. As you can see here, over 50% of residential water use is for landscape irrigation, and of that amount, 50% is wasted due to either bad equipment or poor irrigation scheduling. So again, you can see here, now that 
the indoor things here shows if you have a water efficient inside, you know, you're, if you have the low flow toilets and the, all that stuff, you see how the percentages go down? With the landscaping, 54% of all residential water use goes to landscaping. So that's why we're really trying to focus on that area. Again, I, I know this is a lot for you guys to kind of capture right now in a few slides. And I have some great pamphlets back here which kind of goes over this stuff so you can take that with you. You don't have to take notes. But the main thing we need to do is, you know, water early in the morning or later in the evening. Matter of fact, the state's restrictions state that we are not to irrigate before 9 a.m. or we irrigate before 9 a.m. in the morning and not during the middle of the day or after 5 p.m. in the evening you can irrigate. Check your sprinkler system frequently. A lot of people don't do this. Most people have their sprinklers set off to go to go on like at four or five o'clock in the morning. They're still sleeping, so they can't observe their sprinkler system if they have a broken valve or the water's on too long, something like that. So, and that's a service my agency will perform for you. You call us out, we'll look at your irrigation system, provide you with recommendations, we'll make minor adjustments. Like sometimes the heads are pointed onto the sidewalk. We'll straighten them out so it's on the landscape material and not wasting water on sidewalks and things like that. Plus we'll program your irrigation controller for you. We'll uh, program the system for you so for, for the season. And uh, we'd be glad to come back once or twice a year to help you with that. And something I want to remind people too, as the days get shorter, even if we don't get rain, grass goes dormant. So even though we have a lot of rain, you don't have to water as much in the winter time because we have less sunshine. So as we start to get in the fall, please lower your irrigation times. That's really important. Um, choose water efficient irrigation systems, such as drip irrigation for your trees, shrubs, and flowers. Um, water deeply, but less frequently. Put a layer of mulch around the trees and plants to reduce evaporation and keep the soil cool. And look at these water savings, okay? It's, it doesn't seem like a lot, but again, collectively, we all did this, it'd be huge amounts of water that would be saving. And then plant, plant drought-resistant trees and plants. And we have some programs that can help you with this, which I'll get into in a minute, but what I want you to take away from here today as far as landscape irrigation, don't overwater. We see that happen a lot. It's one of the biggest mistakes people make, and you know, we can come out, like I told you, and help you with that. But not only overwatering can cause disease and hurt your plants, but it could also damage your sidewalks and asphalts if you have runoff going over there over a long period of time, it will start to degrade the concrete or the asphalt material. So it can do property damage as well. And then this is the big thing I'm trying to stress, is know your climate. Try to pick plants that do well in our climate. And I have all kinds of resource books, there's all kinds of stuff online. We have some demonstration gardens like down at Dunn Park down here that shows uh, climate appropriate plants, things like that. But you know, we get that 11 to 13 inches of rainfall on average. So you want something that can live on that. The, the lawns, you know, I, I, I know people think I'm like really down on lawns. Oh, we got some examples back there, drought tolerant plants. There we go. Yeah, I'm gonna have Marcy up here in a minute and talk about her services. But, but you know, that's why, like with turf or grass lawns, I always tell people the only time you're on your turf is when you're mowing it, you got too much turf. I, I have no problem, if, you know, if people have pets or, or kids, you need some lawn to play in and have fun. But what I object to is you see some of these houses, they'll just roll turf around the whole side areas, the backyard, the front yard, because it's so easy just to roll out and you have instant landscape. So just to give you an idea, in our climate here, uh, Bermuda grass or something like that takes about 80 inches of water a year to keep it lush and green looking. So we only get 11 to 13 inches of rain a year. That means you need to supplement that with almost 60 inches of, of, of extra landscape irrigation each year. So that, that's a lot of water, okay? So just to go over this briefly, here's some of our programs. Uh, we just started a turf removal program. This has gotten a lot of uh, people involved. Uh, we're uh, offering a dollar per square foot of turf removed up to 500 square feet, so $500 maximum rebate. Um, we also have landscape hardware rebates. Um, really trying to get people to use these MP rotator sprinkler nozzles, which the reason I'm, I like those so much is you guys, most people have those pop-up sprinkler heads, and those can be retrofitted to put these nozzles on there. And the good thing about these nozzles is they put water out at a low volume. With our clay soil around here, it takes a, 
you know, it, it's hard to absorb water. So with those pop-up sprinklers, it puts too much water on at once and you'll see runoff occur quickly. So, you know, we advise people when they're irrigating with those type of sprinkler heads to only water for about 10 minutes. Let that water sink in, wait about an hour, and then apply it again. And do that twice a week, this, you know, during our drought, during this time of year. But these, with these little sprinkler nozzles, they, it, it's counterintuitive because you actually increase the irrigation time, but it's putting out less water because it's less volume. But it allows that, that clay-like soil to absorb that water. So they're really good. We also have uh, hose timers because we have a lot of people that still have those drag around sprinklers, you know, and they'll turn it on and they'll talk to Aunt Martha on the phone, forget about it, and the next thing you know, you got a river going down the street. These hose timers are great. They go on the hose on the hose nib itself. You hook the hose into the other end. You just set it for how many minutes you want it to water and walk away. So that's that's really nice. Rain sensors. I know we don't get a lot of rain around here, but I encourage everyone that has an irrigation controller. If they do not have that feature on there, we are rebating those. We give um, we we rebate fifty percent of the price up to a hundred dollars. So if you spend two hundred dollars on any of these products, we'll rebate you a hundred dollars. Okay, and we're, we work with Brigantinos in town here for the MP rotators, and then you know True Value A's carry the the hose timers and uh, the rain sensors as well. Um, and then here's this is a new one that we started. We work with uh, Rosemary Bridwell, who's a local landscape architect, and she did three waterwise landscape plans for us. I have examples on that back table, but I have those available to the public. You can either download them from our website or I can mail them to you. I prefer if you, if you guys call me, I can put them on the 11 by 17 inch paper so it's a lot easier to read. So if you guys want that, I know from my middle age eyes, it makes it a lot easier. Um, as I said before, we have a water wise demonstration garden on the corner of Six and Powell at Dunn Park. Um, and we have the brochures online, or I can mail that to you as well. And then we have workshops throughout the year. Our next one's going to be October 11th, and it's going to be at Eminem Garden Lot. But this is a good chance to introduce Marcy. Marcy, do you want to come up and say a few words or talk about your nursery? Sure. But, you know, we've had, I know you've noticed, we've had a lot of nurseries close in the last few years. Southside Nursery, uh, Hollister Landscape stopped, stopped carrying plants. So we don't have that many resources in our county. I know we have Marcy here. So she's on uh, Spring Grove Road off of Fairview up by the school, right next to the school. And she's been uh, stocking more and more drought tolerant plants and she's very knowledgeable. She's taught me a lot about these plants. And uh, we're working together to do this uh, workshop on Saturday, October 11th. That's the weekend right after the fair. But why don't you say a few words what you offer up at your nursery? I get 10 minutes. Am I, am I gonna get a 60 second warning? <laughs> we're kind of passionate about our plants. So, we, um, our garden center is by Spring Grove School. It's 410 Spring Grove Road. Um, you'll notice that every spring we've been popping up a red and white tent by Rabobank. And it's because I have a temporary permit. We're trying to do something more permanent downtown. So that's in the works because basically once we've moved from Rabobank back to Spring Grove, People have forgotten about us. So we're still there. Um, we grow all our own perennials and annuals. So everything is grown right on the property. We don't use chemicals. It's completely acclimated to Hollister. Um, the wind, the type of water, I guess. Uh, one thing Sean mentioned about watering, we hand water everything because people walk on the property. And they say, well, how can you keep all this stuff green when we don't have any water? Well, we hand water, and it basically takes us about five or six hours every other day. But the reason we do that is the same reason why you guys probably have problems in your yards, is because some plants need more water than others. And unless your sprinkler is absolutely perfect, which I haven't seen one yet, because we tried it, you're going to end up with flooding in one section, some plants don't get anything, and then you end up having to hand water anyway. So that's what we do. Um, I've had, we've probably done five com uh, personal residences already and we're working on one commercial um, that where Sandy Rose Insurance is of, of people bringing their lists to us. And that's the easiest thing for us to do. Um, 
if you, well, we have the list from Sean, plus we have others. Um, I think where the difficulty is, is when somebody has a professional person doing their plan, they're literally running all over Northern California trying to find their plants, which is fine. Um, what, where we've seen the easiest is when people just show up and say, um, you know, we're to pulling out our lawn and then we can show them what we've got. And we basically, whether you're doing this project or not, we basically have an interview process when people, because people get overwhelmed, they don't know all this stuff. And we do. We're not designers, we're not landscapers, we're plant nerds. Um, so we know our plants and we'll talk you out of something just as soon as we might talk you into it. So um, we want you to be successful because it doesn't do us any good for you to take a shade plant and put it in the sun because um, then it'll not look good. So basically what we ask people, so what you want to be thinking about is what's your property size? You know, where do you want to landscape? Do you want high or low? And key, where's the sun at about three o'clock in the afternoon? Because a shade plant is going to be less than four hours. A partial shade will be four to six hours. Anything more than six hours of sun is a full sun plant. And that's probably one of the biggest mistakes people make is they see a really pretty plant like this one and plop it right in the middle of their yard. This is an awesome plant and it looks awesome right now because it's been sitting under 65% shade cloth. This is a shade plant. So the rest of these are full sun. So we basically have the plants in the areas that you would put them in your yard. So when you walk onto our property, all the full sun plants are in the full sun. And so you can see right where it was grown. These plants were started somewhere around January. We bring them in little plugs. Um, so that, so aside from the sun and then um, what kind of watering, and then just like, do you like yellows? Do you like purples? Do you like ornamental grasses? This is a California native. It's called Batula Blonde Ambition. This is on your list. All of these plants, I brought plants that are all on your list. So, I mean, we can go through them or is my 10 minutes up? I just, I'm just, I, I appreciate everybody coming today, but I know everybody's got things to do today, so I'm trying to get through this here. But I thank you for bringing those, Marcy. Yes. I'm glad she brought, I'm glad she brought flowering plants because, you know, most people when they think of drought time, they think of desert cactus or succulents and things like that. And you can have a beautiful yard with all these different colors if you get the right plant. So it's great having a local resource like that there. I still got a couple more here. Okay, so my call to action today is call my agency. Okay, I can send uh, Leo Vasquez as my conservation technician and he'll He'll come out to your house and we do a leak check. These are all the things we'll do when we come out to your home. We'll do a leak check, install low flow shower heads and aerators, check your irrigation systems, make adjustments if necessary and recommendations. We we'll give you a suggested watering schedule to follow for your property. We provide you with a hose nozzle with an automatic shutoff device on it. We look at your water softener, make sure that's set properly for your area because you know our hardness levels differ in in different areas of the town. So we, we check your hardness right there on site and adjust your water softener. And then we inform you of different rebates that may apply to your property. But you know, everybody's house and habits are different. So I really encourage you to call us. We come out, we see you. We see what's going on at your house. You know, you have kids, you have a lot of landscaping, older appliances, and then we can tell you this is what you need to do. So that's, that's the call to action today, okay? My card's back there. So that's for the residents. Um, I just want to go over briefly the businesses. Um, as David was saying, we're the Green Business Committee of the Chamber. We also have a Green Business Certification for businesses in town. And um, these are a, a great program for businesses where we can go through and, um, oops. To be certified green, participating businesses must be in compliance with regulatory agencies and meet program criteria for conserving resources, preventing pollution, and minimizing waste. And this will help your bottom line as well. Um, you know, these things actually save you money. It's good image for the community to show you're doing your part. And you can display this little uh, green business program on your window and people will know that you care about our community and go the extra mile to help to save our resources. So it's a great way to market your business save money and help our community so it's a, a win for everybody and i also want to go over these other programs here for business 
our um, low flow faucetators, just like for residences. Uh, we do the tabletop cards for, uh, uh, or for restaurants, which I need to get some printed to give to Debbie so she can hand out to the businesses. But um, we have the hotel. I've gotten a lot of good feedback from hotels where we have the cards you can put in the, in the room that say, you know, leave your towel up on the rack if you don't need a new one. Uh, don't change the sheets on our bed. We, we're okay with them, you know, for a couple days. So we have those cards that we give to the hotels. Uh, we have the toilet program for businesses. We help you with landscape as well. We'd be glad to come out and see if there's a way we could uh, reduce your water use. And then we have rebates for high efficiency commercial clothes washers as well. So we have those things for business. I went over that. And then when I talk about institutional uh, uh, businesses or, or programs, it's for mainly for schools and government. Our schools around here have a lot of turf areas. Uh, we've done Margaret Mays, Gavilon Hills. We went out there and, and helped them with their field because they had like mixed heads out there and had some problems. We aerated the field, allowed the, the water to percolate down better. So we can do that at schools. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting the, the maintenance people out at the Hollister School District today to talk about an action plan out there at some of the schools. Uh, we also have uh, workshops for landscape personnel uh, we hold workshops for residents, we do them for landscape personnel, and we do them for ag as well. So we, we try to offer a whole palette of uh, new educational materials for people each year. Um, your input is welcome. If you have some certain information you'd like somebody to come and have a workshop about, I'd be more than happy to try to fulfill that. So give me some feedback on that. And then, of course, we're, we're able to come out and do presentations to your staff or students or, or Whoever will listen, I'll talk to anybody about ways they can conserve water. Okay? Um, and then, like I said, the ag uh, workshops for the ag customers, we try to do two or three a year. Um, we've done everything from water efficiency, pesticide use, pumping efficiency. And then, like I said, if you guys, uh, you know, I know Wayne's not shy, if you, <laughs> if you want to have some ideas for this year, let me know. I'll try to fulfill that. So, my card's on the back table there. And then um, I want to get into uh, introducing the, the next guest, which would be Athena Pratt. And Athena, let me open your uh, presentation here. Go ahead, David. Let's have an applause for my co-host, Sean Novak. <laughs> Not only does uh, Sean know the subject matter, but he, he, you, know, you can tell he really cares. He cares about saving water. And um, hey, you know, I know going back to Van Gogh, he liked to paint sunflowers. I don't know. I had sunflowers growing in our backyard. They didn't seem, they seem to grow everywhere. I don't know how much water they take, but uh, I also like cactus. I like the southwestern look. <laughs> but before our final speaker, I was requested just to say a few words about the natural resource conservation. And um, I'll just make it brief because we are running short on time here. The Hollister, uh, let me go back here, excuse me. The Natural Resource Conservation Service, or NRCS, is USDA's principal agency for providing conservation assistance to private landowners, conservation districts, tribes, and other organizations. NRCS provides technical assistance supported by science-based technology to help people conserve, maintain, and improve natural resources. So without any further ado, here's Athena Pratt. Thank you. Good morning. So the local NRCS office serves San Benito and Santa Clara counties. And in this county, we work closely with the San Benito Resource Conservation District. And I think a lot of farmers in this county have done, done their time serving on our local Resource Conservation District Board, which is really great because they provide local input to this federal agency, USDA, on what are the local concerns and how can our office, um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, prioritize funding or look to other partner organizations and figure out some um, ways that we can address these local concerns. 
This is um, from a report that came out la in July. It's the economic impact of this drought. They tried to predict a little bit if the drought continued into 2015, which the report said most likely this winter will be a low rainfall year. Not really good news, unfortunately. Uh, most of these impacts are in the Central Valley, <coughs> where the surface water reduction 6.6 .6 million acre feet, that's a lot of water. So people are making up for it by pumping groundwater. Um, they're already recording a lot of losses in tied to following and water stress by crops that they're not following, following some of the orchards. Um, they take that direct loss, multiply it by an economic multiplier to get uh, an estimate of the total economic damage to our state from this current drought. On the Central Coast, this impact is not so pronounced because, as Harry said, we're fortunate to still have some good groundwater resources to tap into. Only about 19,000 acres have been fallowed compared to the 400 plus thousand in the valley. Um, but everywhere, people are spending more money pumping water, and that's a big concern that we're hearing from farmers is, my electric bill is horrible. And I'm not going to go into depth about it, but PG&E does offer some rebates. We'd like for folks to take a look at the PG&E website. Um, there's a business section and there's an agriculture section. There was a report from a state-owned well out of Sacramento. They had a drop of 100 feet in their water level in three months this year. So this is from a report from the State Water Resources. It's a 2009 water plan. They did some updates in 2013. Um, th they're saying that basically they are acknowledging that farmers have made significant investments in their infrastructure to reduce water use. They are taking advantage of mobile lab services to evaluate the efficiency of their systems. And then things that once were considered innovative or cutting edge are now standard practices. <clears throat> and just in a six year period in the San Joaquin Valley, they estimated $1.5 billion spent by these farmers to improve their irrigation systems. They tried to estimate how much more investment is needed. The target goal is, um, and this is kind of debatable too, but in terms of what is the best efficiency for an irrigation system, uh, the number that is used a lot is 85%. If you could reach 85% irrigation efficiency, you're like at the very, very top. Anything past 85% actually becomes inefficient um, because there's things that need to be factored into for where that water is going. And so they said that while it could be as high as $2 billion more is needed to help farmers continue to make these investments. So the Natural Resources Conservation Service ha uh, is fortunate to have a state conservationist who's really passionate about bringing in federal dollars, which means that we get a little overworked because now we have to figure out how to spend these federal dollars. Um, so they do bring in as much money as possible to help farmers make these investments in their um, irrigation improvements. So there's three basic categories of these improvements. One is actual hardware, either changing from a sprinkler system to a drip system, putting in flow meters, uh, a lot of the maintenance stuff like fixing leaks, replacing worn nozzles, um, <clears throat> NRCS does not provide financial assistance for. We will provide financial assistance for something that has replaced its useful life. So if it's a filter station that's older than 20 years, then we'll say, yeah, it's replaced its useful lifespan. We can now um, help with financial assistance to replace that filter station. And then we're also providing assistance on new systems. It is a little bit tricky when people are saying, okay, I'm converting from, <coughs> from say, tomatoes to now putting in an almond orchard. Um, we have less priority for funding those type of projects. If it is an existing orchard and they're converting from a sprinkler to a micro sprinkler, then that gets higher priority for funding. And then we're also emphasizing the monitoring equipment and providing a little bit of financial help for farmers to keep records, to do some monitoring and evaluate their current irrigation strategies. 
there's three basic things that we have some control over when we talk about water use. One of them is the type of crop. Are we planting crops that are best suited to our environment? This is really controversial, and RCS doesn't get involved in any of those discussions. But we do look at crop water use, and when farmers are trying to make a decision about their crop rotation, if it's row cropping, we try to provide some technical assistance to help them think that through. The second place where people make that decision of water use is the actual irrigation system. And in this case, this is micro sprayers in an orchard. And then the third factor that we're just starting to really emphasize more is the management of soil. And in some places in the country where farmers are, are focusing their attention on their soil, um, they're starting to see huge reductions in water use. Whereas in the past, they might have needed, say, 20 inches to produce a potato crop they're able to produce a very good potato crop with just nine inches of water, and that's solely because of managing their natural soil fertility. Uh, I'm here today with Juan Segoviano. He's our office engineer. He gets to do all the fun calculations. He also gets to look at the hardware, and we like to start at the pump, and we like to talk about energy use, and we also like to look at the systems and try to remove any opportunities for human error. So farmers out there, they know how far to turn on that valve. They're like, when I turn it just so, I know I'm getting the right pressure, I'm getting the right flow. But if you're not that person out there, uh, or you, for some reason, your irrigation guy isn't available and they're turning on that valve a little too far, you're not operating in the correct pressure range, then um, the amount of water that's being applied could be way off. So we like to look at opportunities to remove human error and irrigation. And the flow meters are really, really valuable tools. And in some instances, folks are also putting on timers so that they have some automation to when the irrigation system comes on and when it turns off. And here's this example of a flow meter. This is an electronic readout that has the capacity to be connected to a data logger. And there's a real opportunity to have information overload. So we try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, but taking a look at the flow meters and then running a quick calculation of, I think my irrigation system is applying this much water based on a calculation of how many sprinkler heads are out in the field and then comparing it to the flow meter is one way to check for leaks. It's another way, another way to know if there's a lot of worn sprinkler nozzles or perhaps clogged emitters. This is um, one of our local contractors. He's from the Santa Cruz area. He does uniformity checks, which is another way of um, thinking about the efficiency of a system. Because when applying water, you want to have it being applied as evenly over the field as possible. You don't want a lot of water coming out at, say, the head of, of the line as opposed to the, the tail end of the line. So he'll come out, actually put little cups to collect water, and then compare. Are there areas of the field that are getting more water than others? And then based on that information, we get to determine if it's perhaps the pipe sizes are not correct, or maybe there's just a need for more maintenance. And we do like to see uniformities in the range of 70 um, to 80%. And this is what happens when the uniformity is off. And if it's a pretty uniform field, which is shown at the bottom, hopefully, I don't have the laser pointer anymore. Hopefully you can see that. But if it's pretty uniform and you're trying to apply, say, one inch of water, then when you apply one inch of water, you can kind of be, feel confident that it's going everywhere. Every single plant is getting that one inch of water. But if you're like at that 70%, then if you need this, and here it's in millimeters, if you're trying to apply 25 millimeters at the side of the field that's dry, um, to get that 25 millimeters, you're gonna be applying close to 36 on the side of the field that is, tends to get more water. So you're right off the bat over irrigating parts of the field so that all the plants are getting that minimum amount of water that's required. So the service of, a, of checking the uniformity of a field, um, NRCS provides some financial assistance for that. Fortunately, in Santa Clara County, there's funding through the Santa Clara Valley Water District 
to have those done for free for any farmer that requests it. And not only are they collecting water throughout the field, but they're checking pressure throughout the field. And that's been a huge, huge thing for most farmers that we work with, is making sure that they have good pressure and they're not losing pressure throughout their pipe. And then um, in terms of thinking through when to irrigate, how much to irrigate, just taking a look at the soil, knowing soil type. Most farmers do this already. And then you can tell usually by how dry that soil is in your palm of your hand, you can kind of start to get a sense of, I need to irrigate for five hours this time, or I maybe can get by with two. And then just using an auger and taking a look. And in the first case, the soil is dry on top, but it's wet in the root zone. The field could probably wait a little bit longer. And this next, the one in the middle, it's wet below the root zone, which means that maybe those irrigations in the past have been a little bit too long, so that water is moving past the root zone. And then here, the bottom one, dry on top, dry in the root zone, um, is saying that, well, it could be time for an irrigation, but for some crops where they need some drying out between irrigations, the farmer has to decide, maybe I'm gonna wait a little bit longer. If they do decide to irrigate, then they have to decide how long to irrigate for to fill up that root zone. And this is where actual equipment, soil moisture monitors can come in handy. There's been a lot of problems in this county with tensiometers in orchards because um, the tensiometers uh, can't dry out in the field and a lot of the orchards uh, farmers tend to let them dry out in between irrigations. Uh, other forms of soil moisture monitoring there's the electrical capacitance probes, there's different ways of measuring moisture different than a ten tensiometer and a lot of them do measure some form of soil tension and that is just basically estimating how hard it is for the plant to take that water out of the soil matrix. So when there's very low tension in the soil, basically it's at zero, um, and that means the soil is saturated. The more tension in the soil, the harder it is for the plant to take water, that means the soil is drier. And for our clay soils, we're kind of looking between 60 to 100 as being that lower, that drier soil, it's an, that's kind of the range when it's time to irrigate. And then there's lots of companies available. They give recommendations on how many to put in a field, the different recommended depths. And, and then there's all different kinds of ways to collect that information and look at it, different ways to read the, um, to present it graphically. In this case, they're showing three different root depths, uh, one foot, two foot, and four foot. And the blue line is that four foot depth. That's telling me I went past my time, but I'll go a little bit quicker. Um, so anywhere it gets close to the top at that zero centibars, it means the soil is saturated. And in that, uh, I have a pointer. In that, um, this range here for a clay soil, that means it's time to irrigate. So in this case, it's kind of showing the farmer timed it correctly. He irrigated within when the soil dried up to about 60 to 100 centibars, and then in this case, it looks like the farmer is um, managing mostly the one foot root zone. Here, they waited too long. Soil was really dry. That was not a good crop. And then in this case, they didn't wait for it to dry out at all. They just kept irrigating, kept irrigating. And it really depends on the crop. And it also could depend on other factors, like perhaps the salt. There could be times when you want to over-irrigate to leach out those salts. Um, Sean was talking about for residential, you're going to want to turn off your, land, your irrigation when it's raining. There could be times in our county when it rains and farmers say, time to irrigate. i got to make sure I push that salt out of my root zone. Now's my chance. Now that it's raining, it's going to help me. So. We gotta, gotta be careful when we see irrigation systems going on off in the rain because it could be that they're doing that intentionally. And then the other thing that's a good resource is this climate-based. We have more and more weather stations with better information that help us time 
irrigation towards the climate. If it's really hot, then obviously plants need more water. And then um, NRCS is also providing financial assistance for farmers that want to be very high tech and they want to have their own weather station so that they know that they have even better data to make those decisions. And then um, it all really starts with thinking about the soil, thinking about what's that root zone that I'm managing for. And then after that water is applied to the soil, how far out is it spreading? And in our clay soils, it could move eight to nine feet. If you're putting drip irrigation, it could move vertically, I mean horizontally eight to nine feet into a pretty wide wetting pattern. And um, irrigation scheduling decisions are based on knowing your soil. If soil can be thought of like a sponge that holds a reservoir of water for us. And that by increasing organic matter, we can increase the size of this storage that we have. And the other thing that's really amazing about high organic matter is it buffers salts. So you could have more salt, but then the plants don't get stressed as quickly with more organic matter. And um, ways to increase organic matter are to add compost, to do cover crops. Um, for each increase in organic matter, you could be increasing available water holding capacity by half. Um, some people use the estimate of 16,000 gallons more water stored in an acre. Some people think it's as high as like 40,000 gallons of water for each percent increase in organic matter. And unfortunately, organic matter is very volatile. With each tillage operation, that organic, that carbon disappears. So trying to think about how can we reduce tillage not only reduces uh, diesel use and um, reduces impacts to our air quality, but it also keeps that organic matter in the soil. And farmers that are experimenting with this are seeing some really great results with not just um, soil fertility, using less fertilizer, but um, needing less irrigation. And so having the ability to use less tillage means having the right equipment. And so for, for some farmers, this is a big investment to be able to switch to equipment that is no-till seeders or no-till um, planters. We do have farmers who are experimenting with that and having great results in tomatoes, for instance. Um, this is kind of hard to read. I didn't pick a, a good color, I guess. But this is just an example of a farmer who's trying to be innovative on his own, said, um, asked NRCS, well, what if I hang these um, pipe in my walnut orchard? I'm organic, so for weed control, I like to mow with the irrigation system off the ground. I don't cut my, my pipe when I'm out mowing. And he's really liked this system and um, allowed him to have a ground cover that we're experimenting with because this grass does use water, but in uh, dry times and hot times, it actually improves the production because of avoiding um, burn on the walnuts. So I brought a few more resources here if there's any farmers that wanted to get a little more information on our services. And we're out here in Hollister, out by the airport. Thank you, Athena. Carminer. I wanted to get Carminer up here. I think a lot of you people have seen her around. She's kind of a, got a lot of things going on, but I want you to talk about your uh, your landscape working groups. Okay. And I'll give you uh, two minutes, five minutes. A couple minutes. Okay, so I'll be about. really brief. Um, I don't know how many people from the agricultural community are here. I know I recognize some farmers. Do we have any cattle ranchers in the audience today? And looks like not. So I'll, I'll keep my comments really brief. Uh, my name is Carminder Brown, and I coordinate a small local project called the San Benito Working Landscapes Group. Um, the Landscapes Group is a somewhat informal partnership between local agencies, including the NRCS and Sean's uh, Water Resources Association, as well as some of the wildlife agencies at both the state and federal level that have uh, local staff in San Benito County. The Bureau of Land Management also participates and some nonprofits, uh, non-governmental or organizations that have an interest in natural resource management and uh, wildlife habitat uh, protection. 
And also we um, have invited any ranchers and, and also interested farmers in San Benito County to participate. Right now there's about, uh, I would say, seven ranchers that participate actively in our group, giving us feedback and information. Um, the purpose of our project is to basically help protect rangeland in San Benito County. Um, our group operates on the assumption and the recognition that um, ranchers in San Benito provide invaluable services to all of us, whether or not we're involved with ranching or know much about it. Um, ranchers um, take care of very large swaths of open land in San Benito County. Um, they take care of the water resources, the soil resources, um, as well as provide valuable habitat for lots of plants and important wildlife species. And we also know that uh, ranchers face many threats and challenges. It's, it's not an easy industry to survive in these days, and that's true throughout California. Um, and that, that was true long before this most recent severe drought, but of course things have become even tougher for a lot of folks with the, with the drought. And we also have recently seen the demise of the Williamson Act, which was one tool that a lot of ranchers in San Benito County were able to use to help keep their uh, ranches more economically viable, to help keep multi-generational ranches in their families. So this group formed um, to try to provide, we have a little bit of grant funding for me to do some, some work from my home office. Uh, Lisa Smith, who's sitting over here, you wanna raise your hand or stand up, Lisa, um, is a South County resident who um, does various uh, types of work on ranches in South San Benito County, and she's sort of the, the other half of our of our um, very small staff, um, she's able to get information out to people in a face-to-face -face way and also to bring feedback to me about what the needs and challenges are facing ranchers in our community. Um, the reason I think Sean wanted me to say a few words is that I send out a, um, a email newsletter about every four to six weeks. It really depends on whether there's anything interesting to let people know about. And the types of things that are included in my email newsletter are things like this workshop, um, approaching deadlines for programs like the, um, in the financial incentives uh, that NRCS provides that Athena just talked about. Um, we've included in the past reminders about sign-up deadlines for emergency drought assistance available through the USDA, um, as well as workshops, events, trainings, um, try to keep it really local and people have told me that they appreciate that. We have um, sometimes been able to let folks know about um, sort of last minute opportunities either to attend seminars or trainings, things that, like uh, about innovative techniques and grazing management that help people survive drought. We've been able to send some local ranchers to those um, by helping subsidize their registration fees. And um, we've also occasionally had um, opportunities arise for everything from free well water testing to um, free non-lead ammunition available to South County ranchers. And while these things might seem sort of all over the place, um, it, the way we see it is they're all related to helping support the long-term viability of our ranching community. So if any of you, if that is of interest to any of you, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. There's a few examples of the newsletter so you have an idea of what you're signing up for. It, this is all completely voluntary, completely non-regulatory, and um, we do keep the mailing list completely private. So I'm pretty much the only one that sees it. So um, even if you're not a rancher, if you know people, or if uh, you think you might be interested in some of these programs and opportunities, feel free to sign up. Um, I wanna add one more comment. Just I, as a resident of Hollister, I have um, a lot of experience with um, trying to manage a large ornamental landscape and I have my husband and I have both used the services of the Water Resources Agency. Um, it really is amazing. It's the kind of thing that doesn't exist much anymore. It's a free house call. They really will come out to your house. They're very professional. They will show you, even if you think you know everything about your irrigation system, they'll show you things you didn't realize and uh, help you reduce your water bill almost immediately. So I really encourage you to tell all your neighbors and friends um, but this is a really great program. We've also participated in the water softener re replacement, and I can say that the rebate uh, part of the process happened very quickly. We had a check for $300, I think, I think within days of um, having our, our antiquated water softener removed when we purchased the new home here in Hollister. So again, get the word out. Um, it's a really great service, and we're lucky to have it.
That's a lot of information we're putting out here today, wouldn't you say? Intriguing challenge, saving water. I want to, hey, let's have a nice round of applause for our speakers. Harry Bloom, Sean Novak, Marcy Houston, Carmendra Brown, and Anthony Pratt.